This is your last chance. After this, there is no turning back. The Matrix is the groundbreaking 1999 science fiction action thriller written and directed by the Wachowski sisters. In the future, man's crowning achievement is artificial intelligence, a life form that becomes aware of its existence as well as its superiority over man and wages war with its human creators whose soft organic bodies puts them at a disadvantage. Bloody, broken, and desperate, the humans blanket the sky with soot to sever the machines from their power source, the sun. But the machines, having studied humans' protein-based bodies, knows that there is in every cell and tissue in every living organism untapped potential in the form of electricity. Following this war, humans are grown, harvested, and attached to giant power cells to be used up and afterwards liquefied and fed intravenously to the living who sleep in egg-like cocoons, undisturbed and unaware that the reality that they live in, its textures, its pleasures, its beauty, and its clockwork precision is but a dream of a world that they lost to the machines. These are the themes in the film that I will cover. The Matrix begins with men in black suits and police officers chasing Trinity from one rooftop to the next. The gaps between the buildings become wider and wider until the only way to jump to the next rooftop is to cross the span of a street, which Trinity and the agents easily do, leaving the cops behind scratching their heads in disbelief. If they chose to do so and believed in themselves, the cops could also make the jump. However, they are not aware that they are in a computer simulation in which anything is possible. The machines that created the Matrix controls humans by uploading dreams into their minds that conditions them to feel powerless and unimportant. This is the case with the film's protagonist, Thomas Anderson, who works as a programmer for a software company called Cortex. When he shows up late for work one day, his boss reminds him that the company is bigger and more powerful than its employees who are all non-essential assets that can be replaced at will. To emphasize the importance of the company and the nothingness of its employees, workers are compartmentalized and isolated from each other in cubicles. The only place that Thomas Anderson can escape this oppressive system is alone in his apartment on his computer where he goes under his alias, Neo. In the script, he moonlights by hacking the DMV to get boots taken off of his friend's cars. And when he is not hacking the DMV or burning illegal downloads to make a fast buck, he is on the Internet and in chat rooms searching for the answer to his question. What is the Matrix? A man looks at a boarded up building and sees his dream home. Another man looks at the same building and sees a dump. Someone looks at a child with a box of crayons and sees an artist. Someone else looks at the same child and sees a loser. A man gets an idea that makes him rich. Another man gets an idea and says it's impossible. One man's trash is another man's treasure. Everyone can see the seed, but almost no one can see potential. Morpheus sees signs of greatness in Thomas Anderson even before he brings Anderson out of the Matrix. He sees Anderson's exceptional ability as a hacker, using a computer as though it is an extension of himself. Another sign that Morpheus sees is Anderson's burning obsession to know what the Matrix is. But not everyone feels the same way that Morpheus feels about Anderson. For one, there's his age. The normal rule on freeing minds is the younger, the better, because younger minds have an easier time coping with reality and change than older minds, which tend to react violently to the truth.
And in some cases, exposing older minds to reality results in those minds turning against themselves. Aside from Anderson's age, another problem Cypher and the others have with him is Morpheus freed another man before Anderson whom the agents killed. And as sure as he is that Anderson is the one, Morpheus was just as sure about the man he believed in before Anderson. And there is also Trinity who only follows Morpheus because he freed her mind and body from the Matrix. She will follow him anywhere even if he is wrong about Anderson. But in spite of the doubters, Morpheus puts all of his faith in Anderson and trains him. And Anderson shows a great deal of potential in the martial arts simulation. He even gets the better of Morpheus. But just when the rest of the crew sees this and begin to believe in Anderson also, he falls. Off of a tall skyscraper in a jump training simulation. Everyone falls on their first jump. But Anderson is not supposed to fall because he, according to Morpheus, is the one. In the subway scene near the end of the film, Anderson sees a homeless man and calls him a nobody. This nobody, however, unimportant he seems to Anderson, ends up becoming someone very important. In this case, Agent Smith. All of us have the potential for greatness, even Thomas Anderson. Whether it be family, neighborhood, community, or society, we all must follow rules. For the most part, rules are necessary. For instance, can you imagine what kind of experience driving an automobile would be like if there were no speeding limits? Or can you imagine pharmaceutical companies putting drugs on the market without having to go through the FDA? Or can you imagine what children would do if given a choice of eating dinner or dessert? The problem with rules is that we also follow them when they are wrong. And a sign of exceptionalism is one who cuts against the grain, who is unafraid to question the rules and break them if necessary. This is another sign as to why Morpheus, who has searched the Matrix for years, believes in Thomas Anderson due to the facts that he is always late for work. He uses his computer skills to undermine capitalism and the government by downloading content off the Internet and selling it. He also uses his computer skills to hack the DMV's database to make the police unlock and remove boots off of his friend's cars. He also idolizes other hackers that fight the system, such as Trinity and how she was able to crack the IRS's database. And when agents question him about Morpheus, Thomas Anderson defiantly gives them the middle finger. The system will win most of the time, but sometimes you can fight the system and win. For instance, on August 21st, 2015, Kristen Marie Greist and Shay Lynn Haver became the first women to graduate from the U.S. Army Ranger School. Following their successful completion of this course, Secretary of Defense Ash Carter voided the Pentagon's policy excluding women from combat. And on December the 1st, 1955, a black woman boarded a racially segregated bus in Montgomery, Alabama and sat in the first row of back seats reserved for blacks. When the white seats in the front of the bus filled up, white bus driver James F. Blake moved the colored sign in front of Rosa Parks behind her and ordered her to give up her seat.
She refused, and the police arrested her for violating a segregation law of the city code. When Miss Parks asked the officer why he was pushing her around, he told her, I don't know, but the law's the law, suggesting that someone else and not himself was controlling his actions. Law or no law, if someone ordered you to do something against your moral principles, would you do it? Most likely you would. The CIA released documents describing mind control experiments they conducted under a program called MKUltra in which the CIA implanted electrodes in the brains of dogs, rats, and cockroaches which enabled the agency to operate these animals by remote control. The CIA also explored mind control strategies with LSD, supplying the drug to government agents, doctors, prostitutes, mentally ill patients, and the general public. Additionally, neuroscientists at MIT claim to have found the circuit in our brains that is responsible for connecting emotions to memories. They also claim that they can manipulate brain cells with light to short circuit emotions that we associate with certain memories. With this said, what would life be like if someone behind the scenes controlled our thoughts and actions? In July 1961, Yale University psychologist Stanley Milgram conducted experiments to study the effect that authority figures had on people's character and behavior. Milgram selected a diverse pool of volunteers from postal clerks to high school teachers and had them to take turns playing teacher and student in a memory test wherein each time the student gave a wrong answer, Milgram would order the teacher to punish the student with electric shocks from 45 volts all the way up to 450 volts. Milgram withheld from the volunteers the fact that the student in this experiment was his assistant and that the electric shocks did not increase above the 45 volt range that he administered to each volunteer in order to convince them that the test was real. At 150 volts, the learner or student would cry out demanding to be released from the shock plate and 40% of the teachers in the experiment would comply with the student. However, 30% of the teachers in the experiment would not comply with the student no matter how he cried out. One of the volunteer teachers in the experiment later said that if it were up to him and not Milgram, the authority figure who gave him the order, he would have stopped shocking the student. In other words, what this student is really saying is that he did not do it. The devil made him do it. A defense traced back to our common ancestor who blamed Eve for biting the apple. From 1945 to 1946, the Allied forces following Germany's defeat in World War II prosecuted prominent members of the Nazi party in Nuremberg, Germany, with each Nazi asking to not be found guilty and punished because their actions were ordered by superior officers, hence the name of their defense strategy of shifting the blame for their actions onto their superiors or authority figures came to be known as the Nuremberg Defense. In May 1961, the Mossad, Israel's equivalent of the CIA, captured senior SS officer Adolf Eichmann, who organized the mass deportation of Jews to concentration camps in Eastern Europe. In his pardon appeal, Eichmann maintained his innocence, saying, Also, in 2005, 
Charles Grainer, a former member of the U.S. Army Reserve, was convicted of torturing prisoners in the 2003-2004 Abu Ghraib prison scandal. Among his many crimes are sodomy on a prisoner with a phosphorus light and hooking up an electrode to another prisoner's penis. At the trial, one prisoner accused Grainer of forcing them to eat their food from a toilet. Grainer took many pictures and one of them shows himself and fellow guard Sabrina Harmon posing with naked prisoners piled on top of each other in the shape of a pyramid. Grainer's defense at his trial was, take a guess, that he was following the orders of his superiors. And, not in the film but in the script, Thomas Anderson, like Milgram in the shock experiment I spoke of earlier, turns cops into robots by hacking into the DMV and getting them to take a boot off of his friend's car. But the Matrix has also turned Anderson himself into a robot by enslaving him to a routine job, a boring routine life, and obligations such as paying taxes to the IRS without questioning why. He is also enslaved to emotions like campaign of fear and consumption. And that's what I think that it's all based on is the whole idea that keep everyone afraid and they'll consume. Mm -hmm. Self-doubt and other psychological and behavioral patterns that follow him out of the matrix. You can't fill a cup that is already full. We've all heard this saying. Maybe this explains why children ask more questions than adults who assume that they understand the world more than they actually do. Take Thomas Anderson, who was born, raised, and taught in the Matrix that he is insignificant until Morpheus frees him from the power plant, tells him that he is special, and shows him that the world is nothing more than a dream, a series of electrical impulses that his nervous system interprets as real. Because of these insights, Anderson faces the difficult task of unlearning everything he learned about the world and himself in his former life. He comes out of one system where he had no power and enters a second system in which he has no power. Morpheus's name for this second system is In Thomas Anderson's old life, he paid his taxes, carried his landlady's groceries, and worked for a respectable software company. That is, until Morpheus frees him from the power plant and wakes him up to a new reality in which he is special and has the power to change the world. But to do this, Anderson's questions concerning the meaning of his life brings his body out of the matrix, but he will never be completely free of the matrix until he can also free his mind. The prophet Moses faced a similar identity crisis. Both he and Anderson flee slavery. And later, after gaining spiritual enlightenment and belief in themselves, they both return to the places they ran away from to free others. But while moving forward is important, we must also identify things from our past that can help us in the present, such as in The Matrix, Thomas Anderson already has both the skill set and the mindset to become the person Morpheus believes he is destined to be. And yet, Anderson's mind is still controlled by negative images of his past self. Society? Toy guns. Uh, I prefer. These nuts aren't nut nuts. Uh, uh, hold my other beer. It's an all weather multi rolls. <laughs> And research has also found that children eight and under are not psychologically or cognitively developed enough to distinguish ads from real content.
And like so, though Thomas Anderson is out of the matrix and now realizes that his past life was only a computer simulation, his nervous system has been trained to respond to the matrix as though it is real. For instance, there is a scene in which Anderson's mind recreates a game injury in the real world. Morpheus explains to him that whatever the mind thinks becomes real. Anderson also notices that he has hurt in the Matrix when in fact he is bald. This is also because his mind is still clinging to his residual self-image or his past, which is not real. This brings us to the nature of reality. If truth is absolute, then how can two people look at the same thing and see it differently? What is reality anyway? Answering this question does not come to Thomas Anderson immediately. For instance, Morpheus takes him to the Temple of Zion to see the Oracle, and there Anderson sees a boy bend a spoon. But when Anderson tries to bend a spoon, nothing happens. The spoon, the boy explains, does not exist. After thinking on the boy's statement, Anderson goes on to bend the spoon. Also, when Morpheus defeats Anderson in the martial arts simulation, Anderson blames his loss on Morpheus's superior speed until Morpheus reminds Anderson that speed only applies to the physics of the real world and not the training simulation. After thinking about Morpheus' statement, Anderson then goes on to defeat him in the rematch. In both of these scenes, Anderson's outcomes change when he chooses to see his reality from a different perspective. Morpheus believes that fate has chosen Anderson for a purpose. On the other hand, Anderson is a rebel and doesn't want to be controlled by fate, the Matrix, or anything else. Again, remember that Anderson was unsuccessful at bending the spoon until the child gave him a different perspective. Which explains why Anderson's busted lip in the real world reflects his belief that he has a busted lip in the jump simulation, and also why he has a full head of hair in the Matrix and no hair in the real world. The reason for this is that the Matrix has burned his old self-image to his mind so that it seems more real to him than the truth and how he really looks. When Morpheus takes Anderson to the Oracle, she tells him in advance that he will refuse to take a seat, and she also tells him not to apologize for breaking her vase, which he does anyway. Anderson is amazed by her ability to predict his future, but she asks him if he would have broken the vase if she had not warned him in advance. This question throws doubt on Morpheus' belief in fate for instance, would Anderson have fallen in the jump simulation if he was the one? Or could Anderson die without fulfilling his destiny? If not, what about the man Cypher told him about, the man Morpheus believed in who died prior to Anderson? The Oracle tells Anderson that he is not the one. But like his boss who tells him that he is not special and Cypher who thinks that he is too old and Morpheus who does believe that he is the one. Anderson is giving away his power to decide his own destiny and giving the Oracle the power to define who he is. In the end, he becomes the one, not because of Morpheus's belief in him, Trinity's belief in him, the Oracle's belief in him, or even fate. Anderson becomes the one by exercising his own power to choose his here and now over his past, unrestricted by old notions, old fears, old thought patterns, and self-imposed limitations. He takes control of his own life, his own destiny, when he chooses to be Neo. 
1994, the Wachowski sisters, then brothers, sold the rights to their first film script, The Assassins, to Paramount executive Lorenzo D. Bonaventura, who also bought the rights to their other two scripts, Bound and The Matrix. The Wachowskis directed Bound. Their debut is co-directors, which had a budget of $6 million. Although Bound only netted $7 million at the box office, the film received positive reviews from the likes of Roger Ebert, who credited Bound's style as skillful filmmaking, and I agree. When the Wachowskis got the green light to direct The Matrix, producer Joel Silver joined the project and Paramount invested $60 million in the film. So much more than they gave the Wachowskis for Bound that cinematographer Bill Pope, realizing the added pressure and high expectations that came with such a big budget, tried to talk the Wachowskis out of making the film by suggesting instead that they make a $15 million film. But fortunately, the the brothers did not back down and took on the challenge. In the documentary, Revisiting the Matrix, the sisters admit that the Matrix was not a single idea, but instead represents everything that influenced them growing up, such as religion, philosophy, mythology, the science fiction of Philip K. Dick, books on cybernetics and complex systems by Kevin Kelly, comic books and graphic novels. But the genre which had the greatest influence on the film's aesthetic was Japanimation or anime. This was how they sold producer Joel Silver on The Matrix, who recalls the Wachowskis giving him a copy of director Mamoru Oshii's 1995 anime Ghost in the Shell and telling him, we want to do that for real. Being huge fans of Ghost in the Shell, the sisters wanted Mamoru Oshii to direct an episode of their 2003 anthology, Animatrix, which consisted of animated shorts expanding on the backstory of their first Matrix film while filling gaps in the second and third Matrix films. The sequel to Ghost in the Shell, however, demanded Oshi's full attention and he could not take up their offer. The sisters hired comic book artists Jeff Darrow and Steve Scrose to storyboard The Matrix. In 1993, Darrow collaborated on an art portfolio with French artist John Henry Gaston Girard or his better known nom de plume, Mobius. But it was the level of detail in Darrow's 1990 collaboration with Frank Miller, hard boiled, that made him the Wachowski's choice to storyboard The Matrix with artist Steve Scrose whom the sisters as co-writers collaborated with on a 1993 comic created by Clive Barker called Ecto Kid. For The Matrix, Darrow and Scrooge drew a 600-page storyboard in the style of a comic book that producer Lorenzo D. Bonaventura described as master drawings. So that the actors as well as the crew could have a grasp of what the Matrix was, Simulacra and Simulation by French philosopher John Baudrillard and Out of Control, The New Biology of Machines, Social Systems and the Economic World by Kevin Kelly were conditional reading before reading the Matrix script. In addition to insights these books contributed to understanding the Matrix, the books also informed the design philosophy of the Matrix, especially the film's dominant motif, the color green. The streams of downward flowing characters on computer screens is a pattern that takes on many forms throughout the film, like the rain dripping down the front of the building in the our way of the highway scene, and also the scene at the Cortex office tower in which a window cleaner squeegees streams of water off of a window. And as an homage to the Ghost in the Shell anime, which opens with green computer code, the Matrix opens with streams of green computer code as well. Production designer Owen Paterson chose green as a dominant color to reflect the green login screens of older computers. Paterson also used a green tint to separate the Matrix scenes from the real world scenes which have a blue tint. 
As for the look of the actors, costume designer Kim Barrett wanted Thomas Anderson and Neil to contrast. For Thomas Anderson, Barrett altered his suits to make him appear out of place and uncomfortable. And for Neil, she wanted him to look grungy, but in his element. As well as being fans of anime, the Wachowskis also admire Asian action films like those of Chinese director John Woo and Yoon Woo Ping, whom they hired to choreograph the film's fight scenes and the wire work that would enable the actors to replicate the gravity-defying action of anime such as Yoshiaki Kawajiri's 1993 film Ninja Scroll. Wu Ping also tailored the fighting styles for each actor's strengths, describing Neo's style as diligent, Hugo Weaving's style as robotic, Lawrence Fishburne's style as resilient, and Carrie Ann Moss's style as graceful. Reeves suffered a two-level fusion of his cervical spine and had to undergo neck surgery prior to pre-production. As a result, he had to wear a neck brace and avoided kicking for much of his training. Carrie Ann Moss also suffered a severely sprained ankle attempting a wire-assisted cartwheel flip off of a wall in the shootout near the end of the film and actor Hugo Weaving had to have hip surgery after suffering his injury in a fight sequence. And if fighting with a broken neck were not enough, Reeve shaved his entire body including his eyebrows for the scene in which Neo wakes up in the pod of amniotic fluid inside of the power plant. How is it that different civilizations on different continents or even different planets come up with the same ideas simultaneously, such as the great pyramids of this world and maybe the pyramids of Mars? Or how both Emil Post, an American, and Alan Turing, an Englishman, could conceptualize a computer in the same year, 1936? One would think that there is a universal consciousness from which we download our ideas. What else could account for films with strikingly similar plots and characters coming out around the same time, such as The Matrix and director Alex Proyas's 1998 film Dark City, both of which feature a main character who has the power to alter reality, among other similarities. And there is also David Cronenberg's 1999 science fiction film film Existence, in which a video game experience serves as an alternate reality. The game console in Existence has an umbilical cord that ports directly into the player's body, specifically the player's spinal cord, which is analogous to the coaxial cable in the matrix that ports into the base of a person's skull. A number of innovations came out of the Matrix, among them bullet time in which multiple cameras are positioned around objects that make them appear frozen in three-dimensional space. After the Matrix, bullet time started popping up in films everywhere, like the 2000 movie Charlie's Angels and the 2000 IMAX documentary Michael Jordan to the Max. The Matrix also brought about the concept of shooting multiple sequels simultaneously. The Matrix was also the first black, big-budget Hollywood action film, as more black actors and extras dominated the screen than any major theatrically released film up to that time, and since then, until director Ryan Coogler's 2018 superhero action film, Black Panther. The Wachowskis went on to make two Matrix sequels, The Matrix Reloaded and The Matrix Revolutions, both of which came out in 2003. Other films directed by them include Speed Racer in 2008, Cloud Atlas in 2012, and Jupiter Ascending in 2015. These films never equaled the excitement, box office, or place in pop culture of the original Matrix film, but this is not to say that they were not ambitious. Of these, I'd rank Cloud Atlas as their best, followed by Speed Racer and Jupiter Ascending. The Wachowski sisters co-directed Cloud Atlas with Run Loader Run's Tom Tyqua. The film is told over six timelines, all involving the same characters swapping roles, races, and even sexes throughout all six timelines.
The film's diverse themes encompasses slavery, reincarnation, interracial relationships, and homosexuality. If Cloud Atlas is not better than The Matrix, it is at the least as good as The Matrix and I believe will gain more appreciation over time. My final thought on The Matrix is this. Please don't remake it. What for? You can't break the mold anymore. You can only be a cheap copy like Mr. Smith. So be like Neo and be original. Thanks for watching this video essay of the Wachowski Sisters 1999 action science fiction adventure, The Matrix, starring Lawrence Fishburne, Keanu Reeves, and Carrie Ann Moss. If you like this video, I would appreciate it if you would give it a thumbs up, leave a comment, but most importantly, I would appreciate it if you would subscribe to this playlist and to my channel for more quality video essays and reviews such as this one. Thank you and I'll see you next time.